section thirty two of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section thirty two going to see pharaoh rameses the second by hardwick d ronsley i was going to see pharaoh and stood in the doorway of the salle de monmi nay i was in his audience chamber now round me as i looked or rather on three sides of me lay with their feet towards me what might have been twelve coffins they were in reality twelve great cases of pitch pine with glass lids inside which the coffins and the mighty dead now lay these glass coffin containers were all covered with palls as it seemed of drab cloth a curious feeling of an inquest came over me and i felt as if i were in a death chamber about to gaze upon twelve dead bodies and yet a voice within me seemed to say they are not dead they sleep do not wake them neither i nor the guide spoke what a presence chamber it was beneath these shrouds on my right lay nearest me Pinatem the second the fourth priest king of the twenty-first or herhor dynasty next mckeri ramaka with her little child a pink grey bundle at her feet poor queen she died in childbirth next nepseni the famous priest scribe of the herhor dynasty next notemhit or netemhut the proud mother of herhor the founder of this line of priest kings in whose family vault these pharaohs of the eighteenth and nineteenth dynasties had been so marvellously preserved to us not one of these mummies lived before eleven hundred b c or after one thousand b c immediately in front of me lay four other illustrious dead in their glass-covered drab palled coffin cases ames the first or amosis the friend of the gallant old pug-faced admiral who bore his name and who fought his ships of old so bravely the calf and the north and the going up into memphis ames the founder of the eighteenth dynasty date seventeen hundred b c the conqueror at avaris and sharahan the warrior of a twenty-two years war the restorer of the rightful line of pharaohs after the expulsion of the shepherd kings next to him on his left as i looked rameses the second next to him seti the first his father thirteen sixty six b c both of the nineteenth dynasty next him thothmes the second king of the eighteenth dynasty b c sixteen hundred to complete the horseshoe on the left side of the room we must name amenophis the first who succeeded ames the second king of the eighteenth dynasty sixteen hundred and sixty six b c next to him on his left as i gazed lay rameses the third the founder of the twentieth dynasty twelve hundred b c next to him princess nesi chensu of the twenty-first dynasty and last and next to her raskinen tiu aquin the man who fought and fell for liberty in the war of independence that eventually banished the hyksos somewhere in the seventeenth century b c all this was not of course known to me as i approached the mighty pharaoh where he lay i had a general idea that i was in the presence of royalty that had fallen asleep between sixteen hundred and eighty and one thousand years before christ the thought staggered me rameses kabir hanak pharaoh the great one is there said the swarthy guide and with a look of reverence upon his fine face he moved the coverlet and paul a little from the glass slowly turned it back and let it slide of its own weight off the sloping frame and there full length within his coffin looking up at me with his proud gaunt face that had outfaced the world with his withered hands across his breast almost in attitude of prayer the mighty king in his great slumber lay and i knew what it was to be in the presence of him before whom egypt trembled and the hittites fled and from whom the israelites bowed down in bitter bondage in the brickfields of rameses and patam cried unto the lord their god there anak too the great warrior as he was called was taking his rest he who had escaped from the hittites when he was all alone and none other was with him who had burst through the blazing faggots of reeds that so nigh consumed his royal tent at pelusium 
that day his treacherous brother made him his guest and would have murdered him as he slept full of wine he who had faced death in so many ways was now alone was dead but dead he yet defied corruption the coffin wherein the great pharaoh rested was about two inches thick less thick and much less deep and less large than the one near it in which his father said he lay washed with pinkish colour outside it was within painted with a yellow wash of ochre its bottom roughly daubed with pitch made as all the osirian coffins are made more or less to fit the body this was no exception to the rule but at a glance after contrasting it with the usual elaborately ornamented and decorated insides of coffins of royalty with their winged hawks their uda eyes their emblems of the guardians of the soul their goddess neiths their priests in attitude of offering and the like it was quite plain that this was not the original coffin in which somewhere about the year thirteen hundred b c the pharaoh rameses the second had been laid but one that had been made in haste and that by appearance and shape was as late as the twenty-first dynasty two inscriptions in hieratics bear out this first we learn from these that the official inspectors of the tombs in the sixth year of herhor founder of the twenty-first dynasty visited the royal tomb eleven hundred b c there for two centuries the body had probably lain undisturbed but it is clear that about this time as we learn from the abbot papyrus the tombs of the royal kings were being looted the amherst papyrus details a full confession of a tomb-breaker and body-snatcher of this date we found the august king says this penitent thief with his divine axe beside him and his amulets and ornaments of gold about his neck his head was covered with gold and his august person was entirely covered with gold his coffin was overlaid with gold and silver within and without and encrusted with all kinds of precious stones what think you did this forerunner of the rogue abd er rasul do hear his own confession we took the gold which we found upon the sacred person of this god as also his amulets and the ornaments which were about his neck and the coffins in which he reposed it is more than probable that the tomb inspector of herhor found that the coffin of rameses the second was being thus tampered with for we find that ten years after that first official inspection a commission of priests visits the coffin of rameses the second which is no longer in his own eternal home but in the tomb of his father seti the first on an inscription on the coffins of seti and rameses the second it is stated that the bodies of the kings father and son are unharmed but for safety's sake they deem it expedient to move the mummies to the tomb of queen ansera of the eighteenth dynasty but again the robbers got wind of it in ten years time in the twentieth year of Penotum the first that is in about the year ten twenty three b c this body on which we are gazing was removed for security's sake to the tomb of amenophis the first the second king of the eighteenth dynasty who had died sixteen hundred and thirty five b c it rested here for six years and then as we learn from hieratics on one of the breast bandages of the royal mummy pharaoh was removed for the fourth time and carried to his father's tomb in the valley of the kings he was not found there after all but in the family vault of herhor as we know at der el bahari is it to be wondered at then that this rough coffin case in which the great king lies is not the original coffin but shows signs of haste and expediency in its making now look at the mummy he fairly fills the coffin link yes though he has shrunk as all dead bodies do as old men are shrunk before they die he measures still more than six feet as he lies he must have in life been six foot two or six foot three at least a life guardsman in mould in very truth he must have seemed withered though the muscles on his neck to his spinal column's girth be what a length of neck it must have seemed and swathed though he be in his yellow mummy cloth shroud of well-woven linen yet his shoulders are bare to view what mighty shoulders they were what breadth of chest must have been his i gazed upon pharaoh i saw him standing in his chariot once again on that glorious battlefield of kadesh by the river orontes when he arose as the contemporary court poet pentaur tells us in his forcible epic like menthu god of war and urged on his steeds whose names were triumph and thebes and the divine mother 
none dared follow he was alone and none other with him and lo he was encircled by the katan host twenty-five hundred chariots were around him and countless hosts cut off the way behind not one of his friends not one of the captains of his chariots not one of his knights was with him his bodyguard had abandoned him and i seemed to see the great warrior lift himself in his chariot and hear him cry unto the lord his god in passionate prayer where art thou my father amen has ever a father forgotten his son shall it be for nothing that i have dedicated to thee many and noble temples my warriors have deserted me but what are multitudes of men against me more to me is thy power than myriads of men on thee father amen do i call a light seemed again to come into the dead warrior's face as he felt his prayer was heard in the temple of the god at hermonthus amen heard his voice and came to his cry he reached his hand to him and the warrior shouted for joy he called out to him i have hastened to thee rameses my well-beloved the brave heart i love it has my blessing i am with thee i am he thy father the sun-god ra my hand is with thee all this so sang pentaur the bard came to pass and we as we look upon this great king in his coffin now we can see him in the fury of that desperate charge rushing on his foes like a flame of fire see those long arms and that powerful frame swayed in the terrible contest and dealing the blows of a giant right and left while the hittites fell like chaff before the feet of his horses and we can realize how terrible how like a god he must then have seemed of whom the poet sang i was changed at the voice of amen being made like the god menthu in my might i hurled the dart with my right hand i fought with my left none dared to raise his hand against me they could not shout nor grasp the spear their limbs gave way beneath them i made them fall into the water as the crocodiles fall into the stream each cried to his fellow it is no mortal man who is against us it is seti the mighty it is the god of war i think as one realizes the statue of rameses the second laid in his long coffin as one looks on his face in the sleep that knows no breaking one can imagine the awe and terror with which when roused to passion or rebuke this god incarnate as he was believed to be must have been invested at court or camp on throne or battlefield terrible as his favourite lion semen kef to f or terror to pieces must have seemed as it lay at his throne steps or ramped to battle at the chariot wheel of his royal master more terrible must have seemed the lord of lions and the lion's city heliopolis the son of the sun the favourite of amon as with his reins girt round about his waist to leave his great arms free for bow and spear rameses the second rushed into battle and thundered his commands let us look at his face closely in colour it is light brown almost yellow in fairness the head is narrow and is what we should call dolichocephalic that is the head is thin and projects far backward the length from nose to back of the skull is very considerable there is a swelling out of the skull over the ears i expect the believer in bumps would say that pharaoh was probably mischievous the forehead is high but so far from being straight or prominent it retreats and must have in life taken much from the dignity of the face the eyes are nearer than i had expected to see them nearer together as i found out afterwards than his father seti's eyes the eyebrows to judge by the sparse white hairs that still remain must have been thick certainly if we may judge from a gem which gives us the portrait of his mesopotamian mother queen tua his eyebrows were his mother's eyebrows bald though he was on the crown of his head he must have had abundance of hair by what remains to him at the back it is true it appears now yellow but this is partially owing to the stains of the embalming unguents and the old man of near a hundred summers must have gone to his grave with a circlet of snow-white hair snow-white eyebrows and a snow-white moustache upon his upper lip but it was not in his head that lay his strength nor in his brow nor in his eyes no pharaoh's strength of face lay and lies in the nose the ears the mouth and the chin the nose unlike his father's and his mother's is napoleonic a beaked bourbon nose truly the bandages of the mummy shroud have pressed upon the tip of the nose and exaggerated the eagle beakedness but it must have been the feature of the great pharaoh's face this great strong aquiline nose 
the ears are large and flat larger than were the ears of any of the royal mummies i examined great elephant flappers of ears that stood out from the head i have often seen such ears associated with love of music and i do not believe that the poets penta er and amenemhat would have had so much encouragement given them under rameses the second had not this pharaoh loved the sound of the harpers the ears had been bored for jewels but both lower lobes had been broken the cheek-bones were high and prominent and gave perhaps in life a certain haughty overbearing strength to the less powerful upper part of the face i was struck by the length from the nose to the lip as for the mouth it had once had lips full fleshed fuller fleshed certainly than the lips of seti his father and though the mouth was a little brutal i should think in life it did not give me the impression of sensualism or want of refinement it was a strong mouth it was a stubborn mouth it seemed a mouth of contempt and self-will a mouth of pride but not necessarily a mouth of animalism the teeth were white much worn and brittle but wonderful teeth for a centenarian and well set the strength of the face was emphasized by the chin square and massive with great length from front of chin to ear full of power and force the pride of the face seemed doubled by the set of that chin there were upon it slight traces of a beard of coarse hair that may have grown after death the face was worn and thin what old man's of near a hundred years would not be there were slight traces of wrinkles upon the brow the father of a hundred and nineteen children fifty-nine sons and sixty daughters as the outer wall of the temple of abydos tells us he was the possessor of many concubines and of at least four lawful wives we might have supposed that the cares of a family would have worn his face if the cares of all egypt and the egyptian court life of sixty-seven years for the monuments expressly tell us he did reign sixty-seven years had not left their mark upon it but though a side face or profile view of the great king as obtained by a photograph gives a look of fatigue and a certain gladness to be at rest i could not do what i would see in that proud obstinate face of the warrior king in his shroud before me anything that looked like a yielding to the weight of years there was a kind of what is all this to me am i not the son of the sun rameses favourite of amon shall not my years endure as long as the sun shineth in his strength will not my sun that sets arise in the morning monsieur maspero wrote the day he unwrapped the great sesostris you will find it in the academy of july three eighteen eighty six in fine the mask of the mummy gives a very sufficient idea of what the king was in life an expression not very intellectual perhaps rather animal but of pride and obstinacy and with an air of sovereign majesty still to be seen through all the grotesque appearance of the embodiment i did not find this animalism was in the face rather as i note on looking at my diary of several audiences of the great pharaoh in his death-chamber i felt that there was a certain refinement about a face whose weakness lay in the forehead whose might lay in the chin and in the eagle nose as for the rest of the body still might be seen the wound in the side whence the embalmer's hand withdrew the viscera at the time of death the thighs and legs were thin the feet large and flat i was struck with the coarseness or thickness of the ankles but got therefrom an idea of the robust strength of this pharaoh whose natural force was unabated when the death hour came and who could probably then as he did in the hittite battle stand alone his feet had been after the fashion of the time rubbed red with henna and as i looked on the hands laid peacefully across one another on his breast the left hand over the right i noticed what long hands and fingers they were how neatly too the nails had been cut into points the middle finger of the left hand being specially noticeable and how carefully they also had been dyed with the rich red henna stain before they had been packed up finger by finger in the swathing bands of eternity the linen of the embalming priests ah how one wished to question the mighty monarch but he was silent his mouth stopped with the embalmer's black paste that was put there thirty one hundred and eighty seven years ago and this is the bull in the land of rutenu the hawk of the sun a knock to the warrior he who conquered cush and led into captivity the people of shashu the hero of the battle against the Keta, who washed his heart as the poet 
puts it in the blood of his enemies the architect of the city of the sun heliopolis and the temple city rameses the founder of memphis with its bull arena and its glorious temple to ptah or vulcan the beautifier of abydos the gold digger in nubia the well digger in the land of cush the brick maker at ptum and canal designer in the field of zoan the endower of libraries for thebes the mighty builder of the ramesseum the giver of a hundred temples to the gods in the land of egypt he who set up his mighty double images of limestone at memphis his red colossal statue on the theban plain who had himself painted at abu simbel and abydos and carved wonderfully at tanis and on the facade of the temple of hathor at abu simbel who sits on the southern colossus at the great temple of abu simbel who smiles upon us from the rosy cyanite that once adorned the ramesseum in the egyptian court of the british museum the inscriber of his name and deeds upon the obelisk which stands above our london river who calls himself thereon boastfully but truly enough the guardian of egypt chastiser of foreign lands dragging foreigners of the southern nations to the great sea and the foreigners of northern nations to the four poles of heaven the re-creator of egypt in a very real sense who in his prayer to the god of memphis said i have cared for the land in order to create for thee a new egypt of whom the scribe at memphis wrote all are as one to celebrate the powers of this god even of king rameses mary amen the war-god of the world there in his coffin life's battle won life's long work done lies the war-god and the peace-god of egyptian history a man who in his lifetime dared to associate himself with the great gods of Tah and amon and horus father of the princess meris who drew moses from the bulrushes the oppressor of the children of israel we who bow the knee before the god he knew not how can we not be impressed with the thought of such pride in such ashes now before us yet he served his time prince of learning and father of the arts great in peace as he was great in war for a whole generation would know him more as an acute administrator than as a warrior king and had this pharaoh not lived and reigned his sixty-seven years the world would have been the poorer we feel what that shrivelled gaunt body in the coffin there aimed at and honoured as vital powers to kindle and restrain us still as i gaze for the last time upon that proud forcible face the gratitude and strength of the limestone colossus among the palms of memphis the gentleness and affection portrayed in the statue by the side of his wife at the right of the facade of the temple of hathor at abu simbel the superiority and calm carelessness of might upon the face of the southern colossus at the great temple of abu simbel the fire in his face in that war chariot at the hittite battle as seen pictured at the ramesseum the thoughtfulness mingling with scorn of the colossal face at tanis all seemed to come together and live again in the withered cheeks of the tall old king the mummy of sesostris at the end of his thirty one hundred and eighty seven years justifies all the chief portrait sculptors of his day as being true and makes us who have seen pharaoh again in the flesh acknowledge at the same time that this was indeed rameses the great one what a resurrection from the dead it all is how the centuries run back upon themselves as we gaze one of the very oars or paddles with which they rowed his body across the sacred lake to his burial in the hill above the theban plain is there within that cabinet close by and there too are the blue lotus flowers their colour still faint upon them with which they garlanded the dead king and decked him for the tomb End of section thirty two this recording is in the public domain section thirty three of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org egypt part five the glory wanes historical note the glory of egypt was on the wane at one time the country was forced to pay tribute to Assyria. This was brought to an end by Semeticus, who threw open Egyptian commerce and culture to the Greeks. Indeed, he welcomed them so warmly to places of honor in his army that an enormous number of his troops withdrew to Ethiopia and refused to return. Semeticus's son, Necho, attempted to reopen the old canal between the Nile and the Red Sea, which Seti had dug, 
and he sent Phoenician sailors around Africa, if we may trust Herodotus. He was more fortunate as an explorer than as a soldier, for he was defeated by Nebuchadnezzar and forced to pay tribute to Babylon. A century later, Egypt had become free from Babylon, but was now subject to Persia. In 332 BC, Alexander the Great held the land, and in the following year he founded Alexandria. At his death, Ptolemy, one of his generals, became ruler of the country. He and his successors were in power until in 30 BC, Cleopatra committed suicide, and the proud old land of Egypt became a province of Rome. It was a quiet, submissive province, and for a long while little was heard of it. It came to the front, however, in the 13th century as the stronghold of Mohammedanism, and for that reason was especially aimed at by the Crusaders. End of section 33「Section 34 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dave Lance. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 34. Why Phanes Was Exiled by Georg Ebers The doors of the supper-room now flew open. Two lovely fair-haired boys, holding myrtle-wreaths, stood on each side of the entrance, and in the middle of the room was a large, low, brilliantly polished table, surrounded by inviting purple cushions. Rich nosegays adorned this table, and on it were placed large joints of roast meat, glasses and dishes of various shapes, filled with dates, figs, pomegranates, melons, and grapes, little silver beehives containing honey, and plates of embossed copper, on which lay delicate cheese from the island of Trinacria. In the midst was a silver table ornament, something similar to an altar, from which arose fragrant clouds of incense. At the extreme end of the table, stood the glittering silver cup in which the wine was to be mixed. This was of beautiful Iginetan workmanship, its crooked handles representing two giants, who appeared ready to sink under the weight of the bowl which they sustained. Like the altar, it was enwreathed with flowers, and a garland of roses or myrtle had been entwined around the goblet of each guest. The entire floor was strewed with rose leaves, and the room was lighted by many lamps which were hung against the smooth, white stucco walls. No sooner were the guests reclining on their cushions than the fair-haired boys reappeared, wound garlands of ivy and myrtle around the heads and shoulders of the revelers, and washed their feet in silver basins. The Sybarite, though already scented with all the perfumes of Arabia, would not rest until he was completely enveloped in roses and myrtle, and continued to occupy the two boys even after the carver had removed the first joints from the table in order to cut them up but as soon as the first course funny fish with mustard sauce had been served he forgot all subordinate matters and became absorbed in the enjoyment of the delicious viands rhodopus seated on a chair at the head of the table near the wine bowl not only led the conversation but gave directions to the slaves in waiting she gazed on her cheerful guests with a kind of pride and seemed to be devoting her attention to each exclusively now asking the delphian how he had succeeded in his mission then the sybarite whether he was content with the performances of her cook and then listening eagerly to ibicus as he told how the athenian phrynicus had introduced the religious dramas of thespis of icaria into common life and was now representing entire histories from the past by means of choruses, recitative, and answer. Then she turned to the Spartan, remarking that to him alone of all her guests, instead of an apology for the simplicity of the meal, she felt she owed one for its luxury. The next time he came, her slave, Canachius, who, as an escaped helot, boasted that he could cook a delicious blood soup, here the Sybarite shuddered, should prepare him a true Lacedaemonian repast. When the guests had eaten sufficiently, they again washed their hands. The plates and dishes were removed, the floor cleansed, and wine and water poured into the bowl. 
At last, when Rhodopus had convinced herself that the right moment had come, she turned to Phanes, who was engaged in a discussion with the Milesians, and thus addressed him. Noble friend, we have restrained our impatience so long that it must surely now be your duty to tell us what evil chance is threatening to snatch you from Egypt and from our circle. You may be able to leave us in this country with a light heart, for the gods are wont to bless you Ionians with that precious gift from your very birth. But we shall remember you long and sadly. I know of no worse loss than that a friend tried through years. Indeed, some of us have lived too long on the Nile not to have imbibed a little of the constant, unchanging Egyptian temperament. You smile, and yet I feel sure that, long as you have desired to revisit your dear Hellas, you will not be able to leave us quite without regret. Ah, you admit this? Well, I knew I had not been deceived. But now, tell us why you are obliged to leave Egypt that we may consider whether it may not be possible to get the king's decree reversed, and so keep you with us. Phanes smiled bitterly and replied, Many thanks, Rhodopus, for these flattering words, and for the kind intention either to grieve over my departure, or, if possible, to prevent it. A hundred new faces will soon help you to forget mine, for, long as you have lived on the Nile, you are still a Greek from the crown of the head to the sole of the foot and may thank the gods that you have remained so. I am a great friend of constancy, too, but quite as great an enemy of folly. And is there one among you who would not call it folly to fret over what cannot be undone? I cannot call the Egyptian constancy a virtue. It is a delusion. The men who treasure their dead for thousands of years, and would rather lose their last loaf than allow a single bone belonging to one of their ancestors to be taken from them, are not constant, they are foolish. Can it possibly make me happy to see my friends sad? Certainly not. You must not imitate the Egyptians, who, when they lose a friend, spend months in daily repeated lamentations over him. On the contrary, if you will sometimes think of the distant, I ought to say, of the departed friend, for as long as I live I shall never be permitted to tread Egyptian ground again, let it be with smiling faces. Do not cry, ah, why was Phanes forced to leave us? But rather, let us be merry as Phanes used to be when he made one of our circle. In this way, you must celebrate my departure, as Simonides enjoined when he sang, If we would only be more truly wise, we would not waste on death our tears and sighs, nor stand and mourn o'er cold and lifeless clay more than one day. For death, alas we have no lack of time but life is gone when scarcely at its prime and is e'en when not overfilled with care but short and bare if we are not to weep for the dead how much less ought we to grieve for absent friends the former have left us forever but to the latter we say at parting farewell until we meet again here the sybarite who had been gradually becoming more and more impatient could not keep silent any longer and called out in the most woebegone tone, Will you never begin your story, you malicious fellow? I cannot drink a single drop until you leave off talking about death. I feel cold already, and I am always ill if I only think of, nay, if I only hear the subject mentioned, that this life cannot last forever. The whole company burst into a laugh, and Phanes began to tell his story. You know that at Sias I always live in the new palace, but at Memphis, as commander of the Greek bodyguard, which must accompany the king everywhere, a lodging was assigned to me in the left wing of the old palace. Since Pesomtic I, Sias has always been the royal residence, and the other palaces have in consequence become somewhat neglected. My dwelling was really splendidly situated and beautifully furnished. It would have been first-rate if, from the first moment of my entrance, a fearful annoyance had not made its appearance. In the daytime, when I was seldom at home, my rooms were all that could be wished. But at night it was impossible to sleep, for the tremendous noise made by thousands of rats and mice under the old floors and couches and behind the hangings. Even in the first night an impudent mouse ran over my face. I was quite at a loss what to do till an Egyptian soldier sold me two large cats, and these, in the course of many weeks, procured me some rest from my tormentors. Now, 
you are probably all aware that one of the charming laws of this most eccentric nation whose culture and wisdom you my milesian friends cannot sufficiently praise declares the cat to be a sacred animal divine honors are paid to these fortunate quadrupeds as well as to many other animals and he who kills a cat is punished with the same severity as the murderer of a human being till now rhodopis had been smiling but when she perceived that Phanes' banishment had to do with his contempt for the sacred animals her face became more serious she knew how many victims how many human lives had already been sacrificed to this egyptian superstition and how only a short time before the king amasis himself had endeavored in vain to rescue an unfortunate samian who had killed a cat from the vengeance of the enraged populace footnote the cat was probably the most sacred of all the animals worshipped by the egyptians while others were deified only in particular districts the cat was an object of adoration to all the subjects of the pharaohs herodotus two sixty six tells us when a house was on fire the egyptians never thought of extinguishing the fire until their cats were all saved and that when a cat died they shaved their heads in sign of mourning whoever killed one of these animals whether intentionally or by accident suffered the penalty of death without any chance of mercy diodorus 181 himself witnessed the murder of a roman citizen who had killed a cat by the egyptian people and this in spite of the authorities who in fear of the powerful romans endeavored to prevent the deed the bodies of the cats were carefully embalmed and buried and their mummies are to be found in every museum the embalmed cat carefully wrapped in linen bandages is oftener to be met with than any other of the many animals thus preserved by the egyptians End of footnote. everything was going well continued the officer when we left memphis two years ago i confided my pair of cats to the care of one of the egyptian servants at the palace feeling sure that these enemies of the rats would keep my dwelling clear for the future indeed i began to feel a certain veneration for my deliverers from the plague of mice last year amasis fell ill before the court could adjourn to memphis and we remained at sias at last about six weeks ago we set out for the city of the pyramids i betook me to my old quarters not the shadow of a mouse's tail was to be seen there but instead they swarmed with another race of animals not one whit dearer to me than their predecessors the pair of cats had during my two years absence increased twelvefold i tried all in my power to dislodge this burdensome brood of all ages and colors but in vain every night my sleep was disturbed by horrible choruses of four-footed animals and feline war cries and songs every year at the period of the bubastus festival all superfluous cats may be brought to the temple of the cat-headed goddess pacht where they are fed and cared for or as i believe when they multiply too fast quietly put out of the way these priests are knaves unfortunately the journey to the said temple did not occur during the time of our stay in memphis however as i really could not tolerate this army of tormentors any longer i determined at least to get rid of two families of healthy kittens with which their mothers had just presented me my old slave Mus, from his very name and natural enemy of the cats was told to kill the little creature put them into a sack and throw them into the nile this murder was necessary as the mewing of the kittens would otherwise have betrayed the contents of the sack to the palace warders in the twilight poor moose betook himself to the nile through the grove of hathor with his perilous burden but alas the egyptian attendant who was in the habit of feeding my cats had noticed that two families of kittens were missing and had seen through the whole plan my slave took his way composedly through the great avenue of the sphinx and by the temple of ptah holding the little bag concealed under his mantle already in the sacred grove he noticed that he was being followed but on seeing that the men behind him stopped before the temple of ptah and entered into conversation with the priests he felt perfectly reassured and went on he had already reached the bank of the nile when he heard voices calling him and a number of people running toward him in haste 
At the same moment, a stone whistled close by his head. Miss at once perceived the danger which was threatening it. Summoning all his strength, he rushed down to the Nile, flung the bag in, and then, with a beating heart, but, as he imagined, without the slightest evidence of guilt, remained standing on the shore. A few moments later, he was surrounded by at least a hundred priests. Even the high priest of Ptah, my old enemy Ptahhotep, had not disdained to follow the pursuers in person. Many of the latter, and among them the perfidious palace servant, rushed at once into the Nile, and there, to our confusion, found the bag with its twelve little corpses, hanging entirely uninjured among the papyrus reeds and bean tendrils. The cotton coffin was opened before the eyes of the high priest, a troop of lower priests, and at least a thousand of the inhabitants of Memphis, who had hurried to the spot, and when the miserable contents were disclosed, there arose such fearful howls of anguish and such horrible cries of mingled lamentation and revenge that I heard them even in the palace. The furious multitude, in their wild rage, fell on my poor servant, threw him down, trampled on him, and would have killed him, had not the all-powerful high priest, designing to involve me as the author of the crime, in the same ruin, commanded them to cease and take the wretched malefactor to prison. Half an hour later, I was in prison, too. My old miss took all the guilt of the crime on himself, until at last, by means of the bastinado, the high priest forced him to confess that I had ordered the killing of the kittens, and that he, as a faithful servant, had not dared to disobey. The Supreme Court of Justice, whose decisions the king himself has no power to reverse, is composed of priests from Memphis, Heliopolis, and Thebes. You can, therefore, easily believe that they had no scruple in pronouncing sentence of death on poor Mus and my own unworthy Greek self. The slave was pronounced guilty of two capital offenses, first, of the murder of the sacred animals, and secondly, of a twelvefold pollution of the Nile through dead bodies. I was condemned as originator of this, as they termed it, four and twentyfold crime. Mus was executed on the same day. May the earth rest lightly on him. I shall never think of him again as my slave, but as a friend and benefactor. My sentence of death was read aloud in the presence of his dead body, and I was already preparing for a long journey into the netherworld, when the king sent and commanded a reprieve. I was taken back to prison. One of my guards, an Arcadian taxiarch, told me all the officers of the guard and many of the soldiers, altogether four thousand men, had threatened to send in their resignation unless I, their commander, were pardoned. As it was beginning to grow dusk, I was taken to the king. He received me graciously, confirmed the taxiarch's statement with his own mouth, and said how grieved he should be to lose a commander so generally beloved. I must confess that I owe Amasis no grudge for his conduct to me. On the contrary, I pity him. You should have heard how he, the powerful king, complained that he could never act according to his own wishes, that even in his most private affairs he was crossed and compromised by the priests and their influence. Had it only depended on himself, he could easily have pardoned the transgression of law, which I, as a foreigner, could not be expected to understand, and might though unjustly, esteem as a foolish superstition. But for the sake of the priests, he dared not leave me unpunished. The lightest penalty he could inflict must be banishment from Egypt. He concluded his complaint with these words, You little know what concessions I must make to the priests in order to obtain your pardon. Why, our Supreme Court of Justice is independent even of me, its king. And thus I received my dismissal after having taken a solemn oath to leave Memphis that very day, and Egypt at latest in three weeks. End of section 34. This recording is in the public domain. Section 35 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. The Founding of Alexandria, 332 B.C. by Plutarch When he, 
alexander was master of egypt designing to settle a colony of grecians there he resolved to build a large and populous city and give it his own name in order to which after he had measured and staked out the ground with the advice of the best architects he chanced one night in his sleep to see a wonderful vision a grey-headed old man of venerable aspect appeared to stand by him and pronounced these verses an island lies where loud the billows roar far us they call it on the egyptian shore alexander upon this immediately rose up and went to pharos which at that time was an island lying a little above the canobic mouth of the river nile though it has now been joined to the mainland by a mole as soon as he saw the commodious situation of the place it being a long neck of land stretching like an isthmus between large lagoons and shallow waters on one side and the sea on the other the latter at the end of it making a spacious harbour he said homer besides his other excellences was a very good architect and ordered the plan of a city to be drawn out answerable to the place to do which for want of chalk the soil being black they laid out their lines with flour taking in a pretty large compass of ground in a semicircular figure and drawing into the inside of the circumference equal straight lines from each end thus giving it something of the form of a cloak or cape while he was pleasing himself with his design on a sudden an infinite number of great birds of several kinds rising like a black cloud out of the river and the lake devoured every morsel of the flower that had been used in setting out the lines at which omen even alexander himself was troubled till the augurs restored his confidence again by telling him it was a sign the city he was about to build would not only abound in all things within itself but also be the nurse and feeder of many nations he commanded the workmen to proceed while he went to visit the temple of amon end of section thirty five this recording is in the public domain. Section 36 of Egypt, Africa and Arabia Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Antony and Cleopatra By Sir Lawrence Alma Tadema netherlands eighteen thirty six to nineteen twelve painting page two hundred and four in forty three b c octavius caesar mark antony and lepidus held the power of the roman world brutus and cassius the murderers of julius caesar were pursued by antony and octavius to philippi where they were totally defeated antony accused cleopatra queen of egypt of aiding the conspirators and summoned her to tarsus but when she arrived her stern judge forgot the misdemeanors with which she was charged forgot his duty to rome forgot everything but the charms of the fascinating egyptian he divorced his wife the sister of octavius and presented to cleopatra provinces of the empire attacked by the romans as an enemy of his country and defeated in a great naval battle of actium he committed suicide as did also cleopatra the wiles by which egypt's queen charmed away the anger of the roman general and lured him to his destruction are thus described by plutarch she came sailing up the river Sidnus in a barge with gilded stern and outspread sails of purple, while oars of silver beat time to the music of flutes, fifes, and harps. She herself lay under a canopy of cloth of gold, 
dressed as venus in a picture and beautiful young boys like painted cupids stood on each side to fan her her maids were dressed like sea nymphs in graces some steering at the rudder some working at the ropes the perfumes diffused themselves from the vessel to the shore which was covered with multitudes the contact of her presence was irresistible the attraction of her person joining with the charm of her conversation and the character that attended all that she said or did was something bewitching it was a pleasure merely to hear the sound of her voice with which like an instrument of many strings she could pass from one language to another plato admits four sorts of flattery but she had a thousand were antony serious or disposed to mirth she had at any moment some new delight or charm to meet his wishes at every turn she was upon him and let him escape her neither by night nor by day end of section 36 this recording is in the public domain Section 37 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia as the narrator. Thomas Peter as Dolabella. Monica as Charmian. Sandra Schmidt as Cleopatra. Eva Davis as Iris. Roger Moline as Guardsman. Nemo as the clown philip gould as the first guard larry wilson as the second guard and alan mapstone as caesar the world story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section thirty seven the death of cleopatra thirty b c by william shakespeare where is the queen behold sir exit dolabella madam as thereto sworn by your command which my love makes religion to obey i tell you this caesar through syria intends his journey and within three days you with your children will be sent before make your best use of this i have performed your pleasure and my promise dolabella i shall remain your debtor I, your servant. Adieu, good queen. I must attend on Caesar. Farewell, and thanks. Exit Dolabella. Now, Iras, what thinkst thou? Thou, an Egyptian puppet, shalt be shown in Rome, as well as I. Mechanic slaves with greasy aprons, rules and hammers, shall uplift us to the view. In their thick breaths, rank of gross diet, shall we be enclouded and forced to drink their vapour the gods forbid nay tis most certain iris saucy lictors will catch at us like strumpets and scald rhymers ballad us out of tune the quick comedians extemporally will stage us and present our alexandrian revels antony shall be brought drunken forth and i shall see some squeaking cleopatra boy my greatness in the posture of a whore oh the good gods nay that's certain i'll never see it for i am sure my nails are stronger than mine eyes why that's the way to fool their preparation and to conquer their most absurd intents re-enter charmian now charmian show me my women like a queen go fetch my best attires i am again for sidness to meet mark anthony sirrah iris go now noble charmian will dispatch indeed and when thou hast done this chair i'll give thee leave to play till doomsday bring our crown and all exit iris a noise within wherefore is this noise enter a guardsman here is a rural fellow that will not be denied your highness's presence he brings you figs let him come in exit guardsman what poor an instrument may do a noble deed 
he brings me liberty my resolutions placed and i have nothing of woman in me now from head to foot i am marble constant now the fleeting moon no planet is of mine re-enter guardsman with clown bringing in a basket this is the man avoid and leave him exit guardsman hast thou the pretty worm of nilus there that kills and paints not truly i have him but i would not be the party that should desire you to touch him for his biting is immortal those that do die of it do seldom or never recover rememberst thou any that have died on it very many men and women too i heard of one of them no longer than yesterday a very honest woman but something given to lie as a woman should not do but in the way of honesty how she died of the biting of it what pain she felt truly she makes a very good report of the worm but he that will believe all that they say shall never be saved by half that they do but this is most fallible the worm's an odd worm get thee hence farewell i wish you all joy of the worm setting down his basket farewell you must think this look you that the worm will do his kind ay ay farewell look you the worm is not to be trusted but in the keeping of wise people for indeed there is no goodness in the worm take down no care it shall be heeded very good give it nothing i pray you for it is not worth the feeding will it eat me you must not think i am so simple but i know the devil himself when i eat a woman i know that a woman is a dish for the gods if the devil dress her not but truly these same horse on devils do the gods great harm in their women for in every ten that they make the devils mar five well get thee gone farewell yes forsooth i wish you joy of the worm exit re-enter iris with a robe crown etc give me my robe put on my crown i have immortal longings in me now no more the juice of egypt's grape shall moist this lip yeah yeah good iris quick methinks i hear anthony call i see him rouse himself to praise my noble act i hear him mock the luck of caesar which the gods give men to excuse their after wrath husband i come now to that name my courage prove my title i am fire and air my other elements i give to baser life so have you done come then and take the last warmth of my lips farewell kind charmian iris long farewell kisses them iris falls and dies have i the aspic on my lips dost fall if thou and nature can so gently part the stroke of death is as a lover's pinch which hurts and is desired dost thou lie still if thus thou vanishest thou tellst the world it is not worth leave-taking this saw a thick cloud and rain that i may say the gods themselves do weep this proves me base if she first meet the curled antony he'll make demand of her and spend that kiss which is my heaven to have to an asp which she applies to her breast come thou mortal wretch with thy sharp teeth this knot intrinsicate of life at once untie poor venomous fool be angry and dispatch oh couldst thou speak that i might hear thee call great caesar ass unpolicied oh eastern star peace peace dost thou not see my baby at my breast that sucks the nurse asleep oh break oh break as sweet as balm as soft as air as gentle oh anthony nay i will take thee too applying another asp to her arm what should i stay dies in this vile world so fare thee well now boast thee death in thy position lies alas unparalleled 
downy windows close and golden phoebus never be beheld of eyes again so royal your crowns awry i'll mend it and then play enter the guard rushing in where is the queen speak softly wake her not caesar hath sent too slow a messenger applies an asp oh come apace dispatch i partly feel thee approach ho all's not well caesar's beguiled there's dolabella sent from caesar call him what work is here charmian is this well done it is well done and fitting for a princess descended of so many royal kings ah soldier dies re-enter dolabella how goes it here all dead caesar thy thoughts touch their effects in this thyself art coming to see perform the dreaded act which thou so sought'st to hinder within away there away for caesar re-enter caesar and all his train marching o oh, sir you are too sure an augurer that you did fear is done bravest at the last she levelled our purposes and being royal took her own way the manner of their deaths i do not see them bleed who was the last with them a simple countryman that brought her figs this was his basket poisoned then o caesar this charmian lived but now she stood and spake i found her trimming up the diadem on her dead mistress tremblingly she stood and on the sudden dropped o oh, noble weakness if they had swallowed poison twould appear by external swelling but she looks like sleep as she would catch another antony in her strong toil of grace here on her breast there is a vent of blood and something blown the like is on her arm this is an aspic's trail and these fig leaves have slime upon them such as the aspic leaves upon the caves of nile most probable that so she died for her physician tells me she hath pursued conclusions infinite of easy ways to die take up her bed and bear her women from the monument she shall be buried by her antony no grave upon the earth shall clip in it a pair so famous high events as these strike those that make them and their story is no less in pity than his glory which brought them to be lamented our army shall in solemn show attend this funeral and then to rome come dolabella see high order in this great solemnity exeunt end of section thirty seven this recording is in the public domain section thirty eight of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org egypt part six modern egypt historical note while napoleon was at war with england at the close of the eighteenth century he attacked egypt in order to cut off great britain from her possessions in the east he was successful in the battle of the pyramids but three years later the french were driven from the country in eighteen sixty nine the suez canal was opened by eighteen seventy nine the public debt of egypt had reached an amount alarming to the bankers of england and france who were financing the country the result was the putting of the khedive under the supervision of those two governments and afterward under that of an english financial adviser three years later the egyptian army rose against the khedive and in order to protect the english shareholders in the suez canal great britain sent troops to egypt to support his authority the same thing was done when the sudanese revolted against him 
Generals Gordon and Wolseley, were sent against them, but it was not until 1896 that the government was restored to power. In 1911, Lord Kitchener was made British agent and consul general in Egypt. He did much to help the rural population and improve the condition of the country by introducing systematized irrigation, expediting the administration of justice, etc. The French have no longer any power in the country. End of section 38. This recording is in the public domain. Section 39 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, read for LibriVox.org by phone. Bonaparte in Egypt by Jean-Baptiste Édouard Détail, France, 1848. Painting, page 214. In 1798, Napoleon invaded Egypt with an army of 35,000 men for the purpose of cutting off England's communication with India. After defeating the Egyptians at the Battle of the Pyramids, he entered Cairo and commenced to reorganize the administration of the country. His ambitious plans were frustrated by the destruction of the French fleet by Lord Nelson, and his invasion of Syria was checked by the obstinate resistance of the city of Acre. Alarmed by the aspect of affairs at home, and realizing that he could accomplish nothing further in Egypt, he set sail for France on the 23rd day of August, 1799. The army that he left behind him held Egypt until 1801, when it was expelled by the English and Turks, and the country was restored to Ottoman's rule. In this picture, Napoleon, surrounded by his generals, is receiving battle flags captured from the enemy. At the right is seen the famous regiment of dromedaries, so called because the soldiers were mounted upon these animals. In the foreground is a group of prisoners guarded by soldiers. End of section 39. This recording is in the public domain. Section 40 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3. Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 40. The Battle of the Pyramids. 1798 by john s c abbott early on the morning of the sixth of july the army commenced its march over the apparently boundless plain of shifting sands no living creature met the eye but a few arab horsemen who occasionally appeared and disappeared at the horizon and who concealing themselves behind the sand hills immediately murdered any stragglers who wandered from the ranks or from sickness or exhaustion loitered behind Four days of inconceivable suffering were occupied in crossing the desert. The soldiers, accustomed to the luxuriance, beauty, and abundance of the valleys of Italy, were plunged into the most abject depression. Even the officers found their firmness giving way, and Lanet and Murat, in paroxysm of despair, dashed their hats upon the sand and trampled them underfoot many fell and perished on the long and dreary route but the dense columns toiled on hour after hour weary hungry and faint and thirsty the hot sun blazing down upon their unsheltered heads and the yielding sands burning their blistered feet at the commencement of the enterprise napoleon had promised to each of his soldiers seven acres of land as they looked around upon this dreary and boundless ocean of sand they spoke jocularly of his moderation in promising them but seven acres. The young rogue, said they, might safely have offered us as much as we chose to take. We should certainly not have abused his good nature. Nothing can show more strikingly the singular control which Napoleon had obtained over his army than the fact that under these circumstances no one murmured against him. He toiled along on foot at the head of the column, sharing the fatigue of the most humble soldiers. Like them, he threw himself upon the sands at night, with the sand for his pillow. And secreting no luxuries for himself, he ate the coarse beans which afforded the only food for the army. He was ever the last to fold his cloak around him for the night, and the first to spring from the ground in the morning. 
the soldiers bitterly cursed the government who had sent them to that land of barrenness and desolation seeing the men of science stopping to examine the antiquities they accused them of being the authors of the expedition and revenged themselves with witticism but no one uttered a word against napoleon his presence overawed all he seemed to be insensible to hunger thirst or fatigue it was observed that while all others were drenched with perspiration not a drop of moisture oozed from his brow through all the hours of this dreary march not a word or gesture escaped him which indicated the slightest embarrassment or inquietude one day he approached a group of discontented officers and said to them in tones of firmness which at once brought them to their senses you are holding mutinous language beware it is not your being six feet high which will save you from being shot in a couple of hours in the midst of the desert, when gloom and despondency had taken possession of all hearts, unbounded joy was excited by the appearance of a lake of crystal waters but a few miles before them, with villages and palm-trees beautifully reflected in its clear and glassy depths. The parched and panting troops rushed eagerly on to plunge into the delicious waves. Hour after hour passed, and they approached no nearer the Elysium before them dreadful was their disappointment when they found it was all an illusion and that they were pursuing the mirage of the dry and dusty desert at one time napoleon with one or two of his officers wandered a little distance from the main body of his army a troop of arab horsemen concealed by some sand hills watched his movements but for some unknown reason when he was entirely in their power did not harm him napoleon soon perceived his peril and escaped unmolested upon his return to the troops peacefully smiling he said is it not written on high that i am to perish by the hands of the arabs as the army drew near the nile the mamluk horsemen increased in numbers and in the frequency and recklessness of their attacks their appearance and the impetuosity of their onset was most imposing each one was mounted on a fleet arabian steed and was armed with pistol sabre carbine and blunderbuss the carbine was a short gun which threw a small bullet with great precision the blunderbuss was also a short gun with a large bore capable of holding a number of balls and of doing execution without exact aim these fierce warriors accustomed to the saddle almost from infancy presented an array indescribably brilliant as with gay turbans and waving plumes and gaudy banners and gold-spangled robes in meteoric splendor with the swiftness of the wind they burst from behind the sand hills charging like the rush of the tornado they rent the air with their hideous yells and discharged their carbines while in full career and halted wheeled and retreated with a precision and celerity which amazed even the most accomplished horsemen of the army of italy the extended sandy plains were exactly adapted to the maneuvers of these flying herds the least motion or the slightest breath of wind raised a cloud of dust blinding choking and smothering the french but apparently presenting no annoyance either to the arab rider or to his horse if a weary straggler loitered a few steps behind the toiling column or if any soldiers ventured to leave the ranks in pursuit of the mamelukes in their bold attacks certain and instant death was encountered a wild troop enveloped in clouds of dust like spirits from another world dashed upon them cut down the adventurers with their keen damascus blades and disappeared in the desert almost before a musket could be levelled at them after five days of inconceivable suffering the long-wished-for nile was seen glittering through the sand hills of the desert and bordered by a fringe of the richest luxuriance the scene burst upon the view of the panting soldiers like a vision of enchantment shouts of joy burst from the ranks all discipline and order were instantly forgotten the whole army of thirty thousand men with horses and camels rushed forward a tumultuous throng and plunged in the delirium of excitement into the waves they luxuriated with indescribable delight in the cool and refreshing stream they rolled over and over in the water shouting and frolicking in wild joy reckless of consequences they drank and drank again as if they never could be satiated with the delicious beverage in the midst of this scene of turbulent and almost frenzied exultation a cloud of dust was seen in the distance 
the trampling of hoofs was heard, and a body of nearly a thousand Mamluk horsemen on fleet Arabian chargers came sweeping down upon them with fiend-like velocity, their sabres flashing in the sunlight and rending the air with their hideous yells. The drums beat the alarm, the trumpets sounded, and the veteran soldiers, drilled to the most perfect mechanical precision, instantly formed in squares with the artillery at the angles to meet the foe. In a moment the assault, like a tornado, fell upon them. But it was a tornado striking a rock. Not a line wavered. A palisade of bristling bayonets met the breasts of the horses, and they recoiled from the shock. A volcanic burst of fire from artillery and musketry rolled hundreds of steeds and riders together in the dust. The survivors, wheeling their unchecked chargers, disappeared with the same meteoric rapidity with which they had approached. The flotilla now appeared in sight, having arrived at the destined spot at the precise hour designated by Napoleon. This was not accident. It was the result of that wonderful power of mind and extent of information which had enabled Napoleon perfectly to understand the difficulties of the two routes, and to give his orders in such a way that they could be, and would be, obeyed. It was remarked by Napoleon's generals that during a week's resident in Egypt he acquired apparently as perfect an acquaintance with the country as if it had been his native land. The whole moral aspect of the army was now changed with the change in the aspect of the country. The versatile troops forgot their sufferings, and rejoicing in abundance danced and sang beneath the refreshing shade of sycamores and palm trees. The fields were waving with luxuriant harvests. Pigeons were abundant. The most delicious watermelons were brought to the camp in inexhaustible profusion. But the villages were poor and squalid, and the houses were hovels of mud. The execrations in which the soldiers had indulged in the desert now gave place to jokes and glee. For seven days they marched resolutely forward along the banks of the Nile, admiring the fertility of the country and despising the poverty and degradation of the inhabitants. They declared that there was no such place as Cairo, but that the little corporal had suffered himself to be transported like a good boy to that miserable land in search of a city even more unsubstantial than the mirage of the desert. On the march, Napoleon stopped at the house of an Arab sheik. The interior presented a revolting scene of squalidness and misery. The proprietor was, however, reported to be rich. Napoleon treated the old man with great kindness and asked, through an interpreter, why he lived in such utter destitution of all the comforts of life, assuring him that an unreserved answer should expose him to no inconvenience. He replied, Some years ago I repaired and furnished my dwelling. Information of this was carried to Cairo, and having been thus proved to be wealthy, a large sum of money was demanded from me by the Mamelukes, and the bastinado was inflicted until I paid it. Look at my feet, which bear witness to what I endured. From that time I have reduced myself to the barest necessaries, and no longer seek to repair anything. The poor old man was lamed for life in consequence of the mutilation which his feet received from the terrible infliction. Such was the tyranny of the Mamelukes. The Egyptians, in abject slavery to their proud oppressors, were compelled to surrender their wives, their children, and even their own persons to the absolute will of the despots who ruled them. Numerous bands of Mameluke horsemen, the most formidable body of cavalry in the world, were continually hovering about the army, watching for points of exposure, and it was necessary to be constantly prepared for an attack. Nothing could have been more effective than the disposition which Napoleon made of his troops to meet this novel mode of warfare. He formed his army into five squares. The sides of each were composed of ranks six men deep. The artillery were placed at the angles. Within the squares were grenadier companies and platoons to support the points of attack. The generals, the scientific corps, and the baggage were in the center. These squares were moving masses, when on the march all faced in one direction, the two sides marching in flank. When charged, they immediately halted and fronted on every side, the outermost rank kneeling that those behind might shoot over their heads, the whole body thus presenting a living fortress of bristling bayonets. When they were to carry a position, the three front ranks were to detach themselves from the square, 
to form a column of attack. The other three ranks were to remain in the rear, still forming the square, ready to rally the column. These flaming citadels of fire set at defiance all the power of the Arab horsemen. The attacks of the enemy soon became a subject of merriment to the soldiers. The scientific men, or savants, as they were called, had been supplied with asses to transport their persons and philosophical apparatus. As soon as the body of Mamelukes was seen in the distance, the order was given with military precision. Form square savants and asses in the centre. This order was echoed from rank to rank with peals of laughter. The soldiers amused themselves with calling the asses demi savants. Though the soldiers thus enjoyed their jokes, they cherished the highest respect for many of these savants, who in scenes of battle had manifested the utmost intrepidity. After a march of seven days, during which time they had many bloody skirmishes with the enemy, the army approached Cairo. Murad Bey had there assembled the greater part of his Mamluks, nearly ten thousand in number, for a decisive battle. These proud and powerful horsemen were supported by twenty-four thousand foot soldiers strongly entrenched. Cairo is on the eastern bank of the Nile. Napoleon was marching along the western shore. On the morning of the 21st of July, Napoleon, conscious that he was near the city, set his army in motion before the break of day. Just as the sun was rising in those cloudless skies, the soldiers beheld the lofty minarets of the city upon their left, gilded by its rays, and upon the right, upon the borders of the desert, the gigantic pyramids rising like mountains upon an apparently boundless plain. The whole army instinctively halted, and gazed awe-stricken upon those monuments of antiquity. The face of Napoleon beamed with enthusiasm. Soldiers, he exclaimed as he rode along the ranks, from those summits forty centuries, contemplate your actions. The ardor of the soldiers was aroused to the highest pitch. Animated by the clangor of martial bands and the gleam of flaunting banners, they advanced with impetuous steps to meet their foes. The whole plain before them at the base of the pyramids was filled with armed men. The glittering weapons of ten thousand horsemen in the utmost splendor of barbaric chivalry, brilliant with plumes and arms of burnished steel and gold, presented an array inconceivably imposing. Undismayed, the French troops marshaled in five invincible squares pressed on. There was no other alternative. Napoleon must march upon those entrenchments, behind which twenty-four thousand men were stationed with powerful artillery and musketry to sweep his ranks, and a formidable body of ten thousand horsemen on fleet and powerful Arabian steeds awaiting the onset, and ready to seize upon the slightest indication of confusion, to plunge, with the fury which fatalism can inspire, upon his bleeding and mangled squares. It must have been with Napoleon a moment of intense anxiety. But as he sat upon his horse in the center of one of the squares, and carefully examined with his telescope the disposition of the enemy, no one could discern the least trace of uneasiness. His gaze was long and intense. The keenness of his scrutiny detected that the enemy's guns were not mounted upon carriages, and that they could not therefore be turned from the direction in which they were placed. No other officer, though many of them had equally good glasses, made this important discovery. He immediately, by a lateral movement, guided his army to the right, toward the pyramids, that his squares might be out of the range of the guns, and that he might attack the enemy in flank. The moment Murad Bey perceived this evolution, he divined its object, and with great military sagacity resolved instantly to charge. You shall see us, said the proud Bey, cut up those dogs like gourds. It was indeed a fearful spectacle. Ten thousand horsemen, magnificently dressed with the fleetest steeds in the world, urging their horses with bloody spurs to the most impetuous and ferocious onset, rending the heavens with their cries and causing the very earth to tremble beneath the thunder of iron feet, came down upon the adamantine host. Nothing was ever seen in war more furious than this charge. Ten thousand horsemen form an enormous mass. Those longest inured to danger felt that it was an awful moment. It seemed impossible to resist such a living avalanche. The most profound silence reigned through the ranks, interrupted only by the word of command. 
the nerves of excitement being roused to the utmost tension every order was executed with the most marvellous rapidity and precision the soldiers held their breath and with bristling bayonets stood shoulder to shoulder to receive the shock the moment the Mamelukes arrived within gunshot, the artillery at the angles ploughed their ranks, and platoons of musketry, volley after volley and uninterrupted discharge, swept into their faces, a pitiless tempest of destruction. Horses and riders struck by the balls rolled over each other by hundreds on the sand. They were trampled and crushed by the iron hooves of their thousands of frantic steeds, enveloped in dust and smoke, composing the vast and impetuous squadrons. But the square stood as firm as the pyramids at whose base they fought. Not one was broken, and not one wavered. The daring Mamelukes, in the frenzy of their rage and disappointment, threw away their lives with the utmost recklessness. They wheeled their horses round and reined them back upon the ranks, that they might kick their way into those terrible fortresses of living men. Rendered furious by their inability to break the ranks, they hurled their pistols and carbines at the head of the French. The wounded crawled along the ground, and with their scimitars cut at the legs of their indomitable foes. They displayed superhuman bravery, the only virtue which the Mamelukes possessed. But an incessant and merciless fire from Napoleon's well-trained battalions continually thinned their ranks, and at last the Mamelukes, in the wildest disorder, broke and fled. The infantry in the entrenched camp, witnessing the utter discomfiture of the mounted troops, whom they had considered invincible, and seeing such incessant and volcanic sheets of flame bursting from the impenetrable squares, caught the panic, and joined the flight. Napoleon now in his turn charged with the utmost impetuosity. A scene of indescribable confusion and horror ensued. The extended plain was crowded with fugitives, footmen and horsemen, bewildered with terror, seeking escape from their terrible foes. Thousands plunged into the river and endeavored to escape by swimming to the opposite shore. But a shower of bullets like hailstones fell upon them, and the waves of the Nile were crimsoned with their blood. Others sought the desert, a wild and rabble rout. The victors, with their accustomed celerity, pursued, pitilessly pouring into the dense masses of their flying foes the most terrible discharges of artillery and musketry. The rout was complete the carnage awful. The sun had hardly reached the meridian before the whole embattled host had disappeared, and the plain, as far as the eye could extend, was strewn with the dying and the dead. The camp, with all its oriental wealth, fell into the hands of the victors, and the soldiers enriched themselves with its profusion of splendid shawls, magnificent weapons, Arabian horses, and purses filled with gold. The Mamelukes were accustomed to lavish great wealth in the decoration of their persons, and to carry with them large sums of money. The gold and the trappings found upon the body of each Mameluke were worth from twelve hundred to two thousand dollars. Besides those who were slain upon the field, more than a thousand of these formidable horsemen were drowned in the Nile. For many days the soldiers employed themselves in fishing up the rich booty, and the French camp was filled with all abundance. This most sanguinary battle cost the French scarcely one hundred men in killed and wounded. More than ten thousand of the enemy perished. Napoleon gazed with admiration upon the bravery which these proud horsemen displayed. Could I have united the Mameluke horse to the French infantry, said he, I should have reckoned myself master of the world. After the battle, Napoleon, now the undisputed conqueror of Egypt, quartered himself for the night in the country palace of Murad Bey. The apartments of this voluptuous abode were embellished with all the appurtenances of oriental luxury. The officers were struck with surprise in viewing the multitude of cushions and divans covered with the finest damasks and silks, and ornamented with golden fringe. Egypt was beggared to minister to the sensual indulgence of these haughty despots. Much of the night was passed in exploring this singular mansion. The garden was extensive and exceedingly magnificent innumerable vines were laden with the richest grapes the vintage was soon gathered by the thousands of soldiers who filled the alleys and loitered in the arbors pots of preserves of confectionery and of sweetmeats of every kind were quickly devoured by an army of mouths the thousands of little elegancies which europe asia and africa had contributed to minister to the voluptuous splendors of the regal mansion 
were speedily transferred to the knapsacks of the soldiers. The Battle of the Pyramids, as Napoleon characteristically designated it, sent a thrill of terror far and wide into the interior of Asia and Africa. These proud, merciless, licentious oppressors were execrated by the timid Egyptians, but they were deemed invincible. In an hour they had vanished like the mist before the genius of Napoleon. The caravans which came to Cairo circulated through the vast regions of the interior, with all the embellishments of oriental exaggeration, glowing accounts of the destruction of those terrible squadrons which had so long tyrannized over Egypt, and the fame of whose military prowess had caused the most distant tribes to tremble. The name of Napoleon became suddenly as renowned in Asia and Africa as it had previously become in Europe. But twenty-one days had elapsed since he placed his foot upon the sands at Alexandria, and now he was sovereign of Egypt. End of section 40 This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Philip Gould Section 41 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Bonaparte Before the Sphinx by Jean-Léon Jérôme, France, 1824-1904 Painting, page 228 Now he, Jérôme, guides us into the wilderness and shows us the encampment of the French legions in the desert. The cloudless blue of the sky, scintillating with heat, is softened toward the horizon by smoky vapors, through which mountains are faintly outlined. Over the sandy plains, masses of troops march and countermarch, so far away that clash of sabre and blare of trumpet do not disturb the profound silence that envelops, as with a mantle, the majestic figure which dominates the scene. Preserving, in spite of mutilation, a marvellous expression of grandeur and repose, the sphinx rears its massive head, and regards, with a calmness born of absolute knowledge, the vain struggles of a pygmy world. The lesser sphinx, on horseback, himself an incarnation of will and force, mutely demands of the oracle the secret of his future. In vain. The steady gaze passes over even his head. On, on, doubtless beholding the snowy steppes of Russia, reddened with blood and the light of conflagration. The wounded eagle, trailing his broken wings over the field of Waterloo, a lonely rock at whose base the sea makes incessant moan. There is no warning, no sign. Kismet. End of section 41. This recording is in the public domain. Section 42 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 42. The Story of the Suez Canal. From All the Year Round, 1854. One morning, in the month of August, 1854, a French gentleman was engaged in superintending some masons, who were at work adding a story to his house at La Chanaine, a house that had once been occupied by the famous Agnès Sorel. For the last two years he had devoted himself to agriculture and country pursuits. His career would, indeed, seem to have closed, for he had led a busy, stirring life in foreign countries, having filled the various grades of consulship in Tunis, Egypt, Rotterdam, Malaga, and Barcelona, had been minister at Madrid, and finally at Rome. He had shown himself a man of energy and purpose, 
and for his successful exertions at Barcelona in 1842, to avert a bombardment, had been presented with a gold medal by the resident French, and an address of thanks from the municipality. But his chief experience had been gained in the East, where he had made friends and connections, and with a Frenchman's sympathy, had thoroughly identified himself with the politics and manners of Egypt. After some five-and-twenty years' service, he found that his course at Rome was not approved by his government, on which, in 1849, he resolved, apparently in some disgust, to withdraw from the service and claim his retirement. The name of this gentleman was Count Ferdinand de Lesseps, and as he was now about fifty years old, it might fairly be concluded that his career was closed, and that beyond an occasional cast at the game of politics, open to a Frenchman at any age, life did not offer space for any important undertaking. But his eyes and ears were still turned fondly back to the picturesque land of Egypt, and he entertained himself with what could be no more than a dream, or fabric as baseless, of piercing the isthmus. At the moment almost of his retirement, this project began once more to fill his thoughts, for indeed twenty years before, when in Egypt he had often turned over the scheme, and seen in imagination the waters flowing through the canal, and the ships sailing along. In 1852 he had again recurred to the design, and drawn up a program which she had translated into Arabic, and took the step of writing to an old friend, the Dutch consul-general, to know what chances there were of its acceptance by Abbas Pasha, then viceroy. The answer was unfavorable, but already the mind of the projector was beginning to be stimulated by obstacles, and to show that fertility of resource which obstacles generated. One of the Fulda family was then proposing to establish a bank at Constantinople, and de Lesseps seized the opportunity to have the proposal open to the Sultan. It was coldly declined, on the ground of its interfering with the prerogative of the viceroy. Seeing that it was hopeless, our projector laid the whole aside for the present, and, as we have seen, turned his thoughts to agriculture. And thus two years passed away. On that morning, then, of August 1854, when engaged with the masons and standing on the roof of Agnes Sorel's house, the post arrived, and the letters were handed up from workman to workman till they reached the proprietor. In one of the newspapers he read the news of the death of Abbas Pasha and of the accession of Mohammed Said, a patron and friend of the old Egypt days. They had been indeed on affectionate and confidential terms. Instantly the scheme was born again in his busy soul, and his teeming brain saw the most momentous result from this change of authority. In a moment he had hurried down the ladder and was writing congratulations, and a proposal to hurry to Egypt and renew their old acquaintance. In a few weeks came the answer, and the ardent projector had ridden joyfully to his old friend, the Dutch consul, that he would be on his way in November, expressing the delight he would have in meeting him again, in our old land in Egypt. But there was not to be so much as a whisper to anyone of the scheme for piercing the isthmus. On the 7th of November, he landed at Alexandria, and was received with the greatest welcome by the new ruler. The viceroy was on the point of starting on a sort of military promenade to Cairo, and insisted on taking his friend with him. They started. But the judicious Frenchman determined to choose his opportunity, and waited for more than a week 
before opening his daring plan to his patron. It was when they had halted on their march, on a fine evening, the 15th, that he at last saw the opportunity. The viceroy was in spirits. He took his friend by the hand, which he detained for a moment in his own, then made him sit down beside him in his tent. It was an anxious moment. He felt, as he confessed, that all depended on the way the matter was put before the prince, and that he must succeed in inspiring him with some of his own enthusiasm. He accordingly proceeded to unfold his plan, which he did in a broad fashion, without insisting too much on petty details. He had his Arabian memoir almost by heart, so all the facts were present to his mind. The Eastern listened calmly to the end, made some difficulties, heard the answers, and then addressed his eager listener in these words. I am satisfied, and I accept your scheme. We'll settle all the details during our journey, but understand that it is settled, and you may count upon me. Delightful assurance for the projector, whose dreams that night must have been of an enchanting kind. This was virtually the concession of the great canal. But already the fair prospect was to be clouded, and at starting, opposition to so daring a scheme came from England, and from Turkey, moved by England. It is certainly not to the credit of England that from the beginning she should have persistently opposed it, not on the straightforward ground of disliking the scheme, but on the more disingenuous one of its not being feasible. She had so industriously disseminated this idea that it was assumed that the canal was impracticable. Those wonderful French savants, who went with the expedition to Egypt, had announced that there was a difference of level amounting to thirty feet between the two seas, so that the communication would only lead to an inundation or a sort of permanent waterfall. Captain Chine, passing by in 1830, declared that this was not so, but the delusion was accepted popularly up to 1847, when a commission of three engineers English, French, and German made precise levelings, and ascertained that it was a scientific mistake. Robert Stevenson, the English member of the party, pronounced the whole scheme impracticable. Articles in the Edinburgh Review demonstrated with minute and elaborate pains the falsity of the data on which the promoters rested and a more amusing half-hour's entertainment could not be desired than the perusal of this Edinburgh Review article for January 1856, in which it is proved triumphantly that the canal must fill up, and that no harbour or pier could be made. The article argued it all out, with a formidable array of facts. Lord Palmerston's opposition is well known, but the shower of articles in the leading journal which ridiculed, prophesied, and confuted are now well-nigh forgotten. It was first proposed to follow a roundabout route, making two sides of a triangle, with the existing line for the third, one portion of the waterway from Damietta to Cairo, was supplied by the Nile itself so there remained a distance of twenty miles to be dealt with. But the Nile was in itself a difficulty, the irrigation and other works would be all interfered with, and there were enormous problems as to levels, etc. The direct course was therefore adopted. A curious scientific party, known as the Mixed Commission, formed of engineers from all the leading nations, proceeded, at the close of 1855, to make a close examination of the question on the spot, and nothing is more creditable to science 
than the masterly style in which every point was investigated. The result was satisfactory, and it was determined to commence the work. The route chosen was favored by many advantages. The distance, though ninety miles in length, was already canalized by various lakes, great and small, to the extent of about thirty miles or more. Roughly, the course was as follows. Starting from the Mediterranean, the entrance is found in a strip of sand, from four to five hundred feet wide, and which forms the rim, as it were, of the bowl that holds Lake Menzala. Here is Port Said, the gate or doorway of the canal. Then, for about thirty miles, is found the great lake just named, where there rises a slight hill, about twenty-five feet high, then a small lake, and then, for about thirty miles, a series of gradually rising hills, culminating in a rather stiff plateau. Beyond the plateau is Lake Timsa, about five miles long, where there is the halfway port, is Maalia. Then succeeds another plateau, large basins, known as the Bitter Lakes, extending about twenty miles, while the rest is land up to the Red Sea. These lakes were in some places dry. There were to be no sluices or locks, though these lakes would be greatly enlarged by the admission of the waters. It would take long to set out the story of the opposition, coldness and rebuffs which this intrepid projector was now to encounter. His own sovereign was indifferent, but in England the hostility was almost rancorous. It was repeated again, in and out of Parliament, that even if the canal were ever made, it would be no more than a stagnant ditch. And this phrase became a favorite one with the wiseacres, who knew nothing and fancied that they understood. Stevenson, in the House of Commons, renewed his condemnation of the whole scheme, and in contemptuous style repeated the favorite phrase, stagnant ditch. Never faltering, our projector brought out his company, and after untiring speechifyings, pamphlets, repasts, etc., opened the subscription. Nearly eight millions were found. In 1859, he started with the work. His faithful friend, the Pasha, stood by him gallantly, and supplied him with fellas by the thousand, according to the custom of forced labor in the country. Unfortunately, within five years, his patron died, and the present Pasha, who succeeded, had not the same admiration and faith in the projector. He presently took up a hostile attitude, and declined to supply any more forced labor. It is surprising that the blow did not at once wreck the undertaking, for the forced labor was an all-important element in the calculations. But the indomitable de Lesseps was now a force in Europe, and many eyes were following his proceedings with curiosity and sympathy. A man who had done so much against so much was not likely to be repelled by such an obstacle. He appealed to the Emperor Napoleon, and here we see again the good fortune that attended the brave adventurer. He was a connection of the Empress. Indeed, it has been stated that he was grandson of one of the Scotch Kirkpatricks, and this influence stood him in good stead. Further, he had wisely made the shares of his company small enough to attract the humble investor, and as they were held largely over the kingdom, the whole country was interested in the scheme. The emperor dared not disregard such pressure, and agreeing to act as umpire, made an equitable decision that satisfied both, to the effect that the pasha was to supply as much labor as was necessary, with a rearrangement of the concession. 
on this the enterprise was pursued with fresh energy the little canal which was to convey fresh water for the workmen had been completed and at last by the year eighteen sixty five a channel had been scraped out about the depth of a respectable duck pond and sufficient to float a small boat through a couple of years more and it was deep enough to carry a vessel of thirty or forty tons it seems incredible but this progress only excited the derision of the leading english newspapers who talked of cockle shells and who were dull enough not to see that the problem was already solved it was then insinuated that it was merely a coup de théâtre a cleverly arranged trick to raise the wind and extract more money the idea seemed indeed to be generally entertained in england that it was no more than the prophesied stagnant ditch in which it was contrived to keep some water for show more money however was wanting and still this cagliostro seems to have induced his disciples to subscribe without difficulty and then a system of dredging carried out on a magnificent and original scale was introduced machines were contrived on the elevator principle which dredged the stuff from the bottom and landed it on the banks direct finally on august fifteenth the brilliant scene of the opening took place in presence of the empress who had travelled from paris for the purpose the waters were admitted and the red in the mediterranean seas mingled together a glorious day for our adventurer the cost of this scheme corresponded to its splendour amounting to nearly nineteen million sterling including the charge of interest during the construction it was a good deal more than double the estimate but as we have seen the expense of paid-for labour had not been included the time spent had been about sixteen years everything had come out as the projector had prophesied even to the prophets which as the great samuel said on another occasion were rich beyond the dreams of avarice all the prophecies of the ill-wishers and the critics were falsified in the most ludicrous degree the silting up the impossibility of keeping the mouths open the washing away of the banks and above all the grave statement of the edinburgh review that goods could be unloaded at one side dispatched across the isthmus by rail and shipped again at the other side on just as convenient and rapid a system all these fine-spun scientific arguments have been confuted by the event the work remains a magnificent success end of section 42 read by the story girl this recording is in the public domain. Section 43 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia Read for LibriVox.org by Chris Fields How General Gordon Outwitted the King of Abyssinia Between 1873 and 1880 By Alfred Egmont Hake Charles George Gordon was one of the most picturesque figures of the 19th century. Born in 1833, he served with distinction in the Crimean War and in the English expedition to China. At 30, he was appointed by the Chinese government to the command of the Imperial Army, and within a year had stamped out the Taiping Rebellion that had long desolated the richest provinces of southern China. He held various missions in India, Mauritius, and South Africa, and served with remarkable success as governor of the Sudan and Equatorial provinces of Egypt. His method of dealing with the natives is well illustrated by the following story. The Editor When Gordon Pasha was taken prisoner by the Abyssinians, he completely checkmated King John. Footnote, Pasha is a Turkish title, equivalent to Lord or General. End of footnote. 
The king received his prisoner sitting on his throne, or whatever piece of furniture did duty for that exalted seat, a chair being placed for the prisoner considerably lower than the seat on which the king sat. The first thing the pasha did was to seize this chair and place it alongside that of his majesty, and sit down on it the next to inform him that he met him as an equal and would only treat him as such this somewhat disconcerted his sable majesty but on recovering himself he said do you know gordon pasha that i could kill you on the spot if i liked i am perfectly aware of it your majesty said the pasha do so at once if it is your royal pleasure i am ready this disconcerted the king still more and he exclaimed what ready to be killed certainly replied the pasha i am always ready to die and so far from fearing your putting me to death you would confer a favor on me by so doing for you would be doing for me that which i am precluded by my religious scruples from doing myself you would relieve me from all the troubles and misfortunes which the future may have in store for me this completely staggered king john who gasped out in despair then my power has no terrors for you none whatsoever was the pasha's laconic reply his majesty, it is needless to add, instantly collapsed. End of section 43. This recording is in the public domain.